here, and we're talking the Babadook, or should I say Babadook, which uh, is my bad impersonation of the Babadook, who um, essentially just says his own name. Now, the point of uh, this lecture, in a way, is to convince people who don't like horror uh, to come to the film, because I think you're going to get something out of the film, because although the film is playing with uh, traditional horror tropes, it's not a horror in the traditional sense, and it's really about um, the way that the film is trying to visualise someone's inner demons and someone who has been traumatised. Um, the central plot of the film is that on the night that um, Amelia, the central character, played fantastically by Essie Davis, who um, you may have seen in, uh, I think, Game of Thrones, which is in, I don't watch that myself, but I hear um, not only is she in it, uh, she's absolutely um, fantastic in it. And uh, she was also in a, an ABC show, um, something murder mystery or something, which, again, a very good, very good actor. Anyway, she's being driven to the hospital to deliver her child, and there's a crash. And her husband dies in the crash, and she goes to the hospital and delivers her son. So her son sort of comes to represent the death of her beloved husband. Anyway... One night, her son, who doesn't sleep, and he, he's, he's fearful of this monster invading the house, um, he's up one night, and she says, all right, I'll read you a story, and he picks a book from the bookshelf, which is called Mr. Babadook, and it it's, it's not doesn't have an author um, of the book, and she reads the book about this, this, this sort of monster predator in this sort of pop-up book, and... From that, it's like she conjures the Babadook to existence in the house. And so the, 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 the character from the book manifests the house. Anyway, the whole idea of the film is, is, is this monster, is Mr. Babadook an apparition um, in that, you know, he's really there or a hallucination from her own kind of hazy delusional mind? And... You know, it's it's really interesting that the way that the film was playing around with that and kind of playing around with her own mental health. So the film is really about her relationship with her son and also about actually what's going on with her own trauma of um, of her dead husband and the way that the Babadook um, demonstrates and illustrates that. So it, it's not, you know, uh, the, the reason I'm giving you this plot description, ladies and gentlemen, is because I'm trying to say it's not a horror film in the traditional sense of let's just scare the shit out of the audience for an hour and a half. It's not that sort of film, okay? And um, directed by Jennifer Kent, who, uh, you know, I don't want to sort of declare her as a great director because, you know, she doesn't have a lot of um, films under her belt. But if this is any great debut, this film, great debut. Um, and it won um, Best Film at the Actor Awards, even though she had to share... Um, she had to share the film with the water divide, the um, divider, is it water divider? Uh, the Russell Crowe film, anyway. Uh, Russell, Rusty Crowe directed film, um, and uh, which was no good. Anyway, what you're looking at here is the uh, Australian Classification um, Certificate. It, it's rated M, uh, so it's not an R rated film. Uh, I'm, I'm showing you this in an attempt to um, uh, convince you that it's not a, you know, a scare horror in the traditional scare horror. So it's not like, you know, Saw or Conjuring. It's not gratuitous. Um, okay, it, now you'll see consumer advice, horror themes, not horror, horror themes, uh, violence, sexual references, and coarse language. Or you can look at the, uh, the tick sheet rubric on the side. Um, which seems to be a thing that the Australian Classification Board are now doing. You can see, um, and it, it gives you ticks. So themes uh, of moderate impact. Violence gets a moderate impact. Language, moderate impact, gets a tick. Nudity, uh, there's none. Drug use, there's none. And sex, uh, 
moderate I- impact. Um, even though it's it's not a um, you know, uh, if you're looking for sex in this horror, you're going to be um, greatly disappointed. Also, if you're wanting a horror horror, uh, you're going to be greatly disappointed because the ending, in a way, betrays what we've come to expect of the horror. And so I'm not just sort of saying it's not a horror in the horror tradition. For, for people who don't like horror, yeah, right, I'm actually saying for people who do like horror, right, don't expect a horror to play out as horrors play out because the ending is um, uh, very interesting in you know what it's actually doing with the horror genre and the way that a lot of people who really like the horror genre were seriously pissed off with this movie seriously pissed off with this movie because they felt that it was like, you know, kind of a what the fuck moment when it gets to the end, which I think is great. I love the ending, but I don't want to ruin the ending. So I'm not going to talk about the ending anymore. I'm going to move on with this lecture on the Babadook. Okay. So, uh, you know, like I said, it's not jump scare horror. Now, uh, Jennifer Kent, um, the thing about the Babadook, which is so great, is it's not like a, a horror that's all sort of CGI and it all kind of looks like fake. Uh, Jennifer Kent said this, I wanted the Babadook to be low tech, to feel handmade. It's like a pop-up movie, hence that she's reading the pop-up book. And uh, just a, a fact before I forget to say, um, the Babadook, right, is an anagram for a bad book. Get it? I mean, she reads the book and then the Babadook sort of comes to life. So a bad book, the Babadook, a bad book, the Babadook. Okay, uh, back to Jennifer Kent's quote without being distracted. I wanted the Babadook to be low tech, to feel handmade. It's like a pop up movie. The world of the film radiates out of the book. People may say, oh, the special effects aren't very good, but it's intentional that they're of a similar quality to the Melies style. It's what resonated for me. Now, George Melies um, was a very, you know, very famous director. If you've seen Martin Scorsese's film, Hugo, the the film director depicted in uh, Hugo is George Milliers, and uh, you know Hugo's an all right movie. Uh, you know, certainly not my favourite Scorsese movie, and um, it's certainly a kind of, in a way, um, uh, a, a disappointing Milliers biopic. But it's not really a Milliers biopic. Anyway, enough of Martin Scorsese. Um, so she's really interested in making the film feel like a pop-up movie. And the, the reason why I'm saying George, George Milliers and why she's saying George Milliers is in the film, she starts, because she can't sleep at night, you know, because she's being terrorised by crazy Mr. Babadook, she starts watching late-night movies. And on her television, if only this existed in the real world, on late-night tele- television in her suburban Adelaide house, um, play... All of these really great um, George Melies um, silent ghost films, and it starts to sort of manifest itself into Mr. Babadook. Okay, so um, the film is invested in its characters, like I said. Now it's um, I think this is important. It's not a horror that involves a mother and son. It's a mother and son story that involves a monster. Right, so it's a a story of a mother terrified by her son. She's terrified by what she could do to him. And I think that's really interesting. Um, Alex Heller Nicholas, which I'll, I'll give you the link for her article, wrote you know, a really fantastic article on the Babadook and on the fact that it's a, in a way it's kind of a child abuse film um, in you know, what she's actually putting him through and also what she herself is going through. Um, so it's two very traumatized individuals who can't connect with each other. Um, but she does love him. You know, the, the idea that she doesn't love her son is just not true. She, she just can't communicate with him, which is why I think the film is so kind of poignant and kind of so beautiful. Um, yeah, and it, the film, it doesn't want you to sort of jump. It wants you to be moved. And you'll sort of see that in some of the publicity posters, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Now, um, the Babadook is sort of part of, you know, what we're talking about as new cinema history. Um, So it's sort of, to understand the Babadook and to understand its reception and its place in Australia is you've got to look beyond just analysing it as a piece of film. You've got to look at its 
cultural practice and discourse. So I want to concentrate on like its, its box office, um, its exhibition, where and how it played, its marketing strategies, its reviews, fan forums, government policy, all those things. They're all the things I've been asking you to, to consider with all of the films what we've been exploring, right? Now, um, today... I want to explore how a film like The Babadook positions itself as an international Australian film. And I think it's really important to think of this film as an international Australian film because it's often, when we think of international Australian films, we're not thinking of films like The Babadook, which is a very small film, you know, budget $2.5 million, very local film. I mean, Essie Davies has it's been sort of a breakout film for her because she's so fucking great. And also... Um, Breakout for the director, Jennifer Kent. But it's really interesting um, the way that um, the film, even before that happens, the film is very, very international. And the problem also always of when we're talking about national cinema is when you're looking at it, only the national um, ideas and national perspectives um, can it really misread and misunderstand the film and certainly what Jennifer Kent's trying to do. And the reason why the film does really well overseas is because of those international connections. Right, now, uh, Tom O'Regan, just, I, I just want to read this quote to you uh, in regard to what I was just saying. Globalisation is in local production and international production alike. It is happening from within and from without. It is across higher budget and low budget programs and films and is both quality and demotic entertainment. So what he's essentially saying is it's it's there, it's, it's everywhere, okay? Like the Babadook, uh, International Australia is everywhere. Now, before Jennifer Kent made the Babadook, right, she made a short called Monster, and which I'll play um, before I play the Babadook, when I play the Babadook. And it's important because she couldn't get money for the Babadook, so she made it a kind of condensed version, this 10-minute short. And what was what's interesting about um, Monster, which which some people um, um, some people like more than the Babadook, I don't, but um, I think it's a really 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 interesting short film. Anyway, so what she does is she makes um, Monster, right? And what she does is she tours that film through all of these international film festivals. So it plays at like fifty film festivals in Europe and America. And it got a really good response, right? And then she uses that film to launch the um, the Babadook. And what she said was, if Monster had sunk without a trace, it would have been hard. It certainly helps when you're making an independent film to have something accomplished that has done well. And what she did then is she sort of came back to Australia and she kind of relaunched the film. She looked for government funding, uh, which she didn't initially get. So she started a Kickstarter campaign. And I think a Kickstarter campaign is very interesting. So Kickstarter, of course, is the global crowdfunding platform, which is based in the United States. So already she's uh, she's sort of looking at the film internationally. It's not like she's trying to get all the money from within Australian borders, right? So she um, it, it was more just to get people thinking about the Babadook and what it could be and what it could do, right? So they wanted 30000 US from it, and they got that from 259 backers. And um, you could do really cool things with your Kickstarter money, you know, like you put in different money to get different things. You could even get a book. You know, one of the things was, you know, pay 100 bucks and you get like the book that she reads to her son, like the pop-up book you could get, you could have on your wall. Wouldn't that be exciting? Um, if anyone's got the Babadook book, um, or if you put money into the Kickstarter campaign, let me know. Okay, so Kickstarter. Now, the thing about the Kickstarter campaign is, if you think about it, how the project was intended to appeal to international film watchers from the start and how it introduced a particular way to think about and read the narrative from an international perspective, which, again, is thinking beyond just it as a national film or a, a local horror. It's always been an international horror. And that's interesting because often when we think of a successful Australian film, we go, okay, was it, was it successful in Australia? And the argument in Australia is actually commercially, it wasn't that successful. Critically, it was very successful. But commercially, it wasn't that successful. And that's kind of 
a, a, a problem if you're only looking at it, the film from Australia because the film really needs to be looked at globally um, through you know other things like um, you know box office things like that which which I'll get to in a sec. But on the Kickstarter campaign website, uh, which still exists, so have a look at it. Really cool website. Jennifer, Jennifer Kent talks about the film, and when she's talking about the film, she's not talking about the film within. That an Australian genre context or an Australian cinema context. She's not referencing Australian films. So she says this, um, terrifying psychological horror in the vein of Polanski, that's Roman Polanski, Roman Polanski's domestic horrors. All right? So Repulsion, 1965, The Tenant, fantastic, 1976, and Rosemary's Baby, one of my all-time favourite movies ever, 1968. I love Rosemary's Baby. I could watch Rosemary's Baby on loop if I ever got sent to a desert island. You know, as long as the desert island had a um, TV and a place to plug the TV in. But uh, big fan of Rosemary's Baby. Anyway, so she's so I'm sold. If she's wanting to make films in that vein, bring it on, Jennifer Kent. Now, um, she's also on on this little kind of spiel that she does when she's sort of asking backers for money. She's putting it within a particular moment of horror history. So she's talking about the exorcist, um, um, Mario Barber's Black Sabbath, which is actually referenced directly in the film. There's a scene when she's watching um, a a clip from Black Sabbath, which uh, you'll know when you see it, it's, um, it's, she sort of floats across um, uh, the floor. Like she's on roller skates. The character I'm talking about. And then Jennifer Kent does the same thing. And uh, I should just warn you, um, Dog Lovers, it is an Australian film where dogs don't fare that well. I'm just putting it out there. So if you're a dog lover, um, you know, just be warned. The um, I think Bugsy is the name of the dog. Um, yeah, I, 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 just, I just want to set that up. You know, I don't want to just trigger warnings. Um, for you, but I, you know, I, I just feel like you know you should know about um, what's going. On. Okay, uh, she also references contemporary horrors, um, but she again she's going for Europe contemporary horrors and two pretty fantastic contemporary psychological horrors, um, the orphanage, which I love a lot, and let the right one in, which is fair dinkum fantastic. Right, now, what she says about these horrors is they're frightening, but at their core is a very strong story. And you certainly get that with The Babadook. And uh, also, what such references strongly suggest is an art house creep out horror with strong European sensibilities. Okay, now, also, people working on the film were, um, you know, internationally found, like Polish cinematographer, French film editor, uh, American illustrator. So Alex Uhos, um, and he does the he does the titles for the United States of Tara. If you've seen the United States of Tara with fantastic Tony Collette, who um you know raises anything that she's in by at least fifteen percent, just her presence. That's a pretty good presence to have. Anyway, if you've seen the United States of Tara, you'll probably remember fondly the opening credit titles, which are fantastic. Anyway, so he did the book. He designed the Mr. Babadook book, and he did a very good job. So Alex, if you're listening, probably not. I don't know why you would be. But if you are listening, well done you. All right, now um, the, the look at the design of Mr. Babadook is really interesting. And um, Heinrich Hoffmann, who was this German, he was actually a German um, psychiatrist, yeah, it says a lot, doesn't it? It's a German psychiatrist, so he's hearing all these crazy Germans talking about, I don't know, their problems, emotional problems or whatever, you know, you do in the psychiatry room. And um, and then he's going off and making all of these crazy kind of books and stories and illustrations and things like that. Now, the great long-legged scissor man uh, is one of his stories. And, and think about, like, the look of that, you know, skinny, long, big hat, top hat, right? And then um, there's a uh, shock-headed Peter. Again, look at the fingers, all right? Keep the fingers in your mind. And then look at this next image, right, of Top Hat from the um, Scissorman and the fingers 
from Peter. And look at that. Okay, Babadook. Mr. Babadook. That's how he looks. And um, you've got the long scissor fingers and the top hat. So you can just see that she's pulling all of these influences from you know many, many different sources um, globally and Europeanly. Now, I just want to show you a couple of images, which is kind of interesting, because like I was saying, um, she sits up at night watching uh, these silent ghost films. Most of these ghost films can be watched on YouTube um, if, if, if you're so so much inclined. Now, the interesting thing is the whole argument about it being a hallucination. Now, no one ever sees the Babadook, Mr. Babadook, apart from Amelia. All right. And then she's watching these films, and the films are kind of looking like Mr. Babadook, which supports the argument that she is actually creating the idea of Mr. Babadook in her head and she's seeing it in her head. Another thing is who writes the book, the Mr. Babadook book that she is a physical thing that she pulls off the bookshelf. Samuel sees it. All right. And she says at a point um, when she's at her sister's um, uh, party, she says, oh, she used to do, she used to write children's stories and stuff. And people are thinking, ah, well, she's a story writer. So she wrote Mr. Babadook. Right, which proves that you know she has created this whole thing of Mr. Babadook, right? But it's interesting that in the films that she's watching, you're seeing like images. So on the right hand side is Mr. Babadook, and on the left hand side is an image from um, um, the George Melies film, and then um, this is another one also with Faust in Hell the, the, of the Babadook image on the right, and. Um, uh, not not a Melia's film, The House of Ghosts, but you can see like when she um, goes to report Mr. Babadook and she kind of gets laughed out of the police station. Um, you've got um, in the background of the police station, like a, a top hat and coat hanging, which looks just like Mr. Babadook is hanging. And in The House of Ghosts, you've uh, again got all of these um, images of um, floating things and hanging top hats and coats and things like that. Again, it's another film that she watches. And she also watches Nosferatu and um, Mr. Babadook looks very much like uh, Nosferatu in that film. Okay. Now, uh, now, if you're going to take anything from this, this lecture, take this thing. Mr. Babadook, a gay icon. Yeah. Now, Jenna, now, Jenna um, wrote something. And uh, Jenna describes herself as, I don't have friends, just knives. Which I'm assuming is a joke. Um, but, you know, you never know, do you? You never know if she has just knives and no friends. Or maybe the, no, maybe the knives are the friends. Anyway, I don't want to go into the psychology of Jenna and why she described herself as having, um, as having no friends but knives. Um, if you want to, you know, join her tweet on tweet Twitter, you can. But anyway, she wrote about the Babadook. Um, you know, she, she did this little image, nice image. Get ready to be Babashook. And she wrote, current favorite meme is the LGBT community insisting that the Babadook is a gay icon. And I was thinking, well, that's, that's a bit bonkers, isn't it? Like, the Babadook, a gay icon. And then... Then I started reading what other people are saying. And um, like here, openly gay with an infinity for hats and drama, right? So Mr. Babadook, you know, he's openly gay. Um, he does wear hats and he does like drama. The Babadook was the first time I saw myself represented in a film. Isn't that interesting? So, um, and then, uh, you know, other posts are sort of saying that, you know, he's closeted. Like he actually is living in the closet. Yeah? And that he, you know, he's coming out and he wants to, all the Babadook wants to do is kind of live in a house and be accepted and be loved. And he's, he's constantly being shunned. Um, and which doesn't actually say, like if you actually kind of follow that line, the way the film ends, it doesn't actually, um, it's not like a breaking out of um, his gayness. But anyway, a lot of, a lot of people um, from the LGBT community have really embraced Mr. Babadook as a gay icon. And um, I believe at um, last year's Mardi Gras in Sydney, there were actually people dressed up as Mr. Babadook. So uh, I'm just putting it to you. Have a think about that. Uh, great to have a conversation in the classroom, I think. 
I think um, I think it will be important to uh, discuss you know, what you think of Mr. Babadook as a gay icon. And um, I quite like the idea of the Babadook as a gay icon. And the more I think about it, the more I'm convinced that um, he's, he's a very interesting um, you know, gay icon. Um, but um, I'll, I'm just putting I'm just putting the idea out there for a conversation as a sort of a, you know a starter. Okay, now the reception. Just want to finish the lecture just by saying a couple of things about the reception. So um, it made forty eight thousand for its opening weekend in Australia and two thousand two hundred fifty six hundred thousand overall, which is shit house in the uh, you know in a successful Australian turn. You would think. But actually, um, let me go on and I'll explain how it's actually not that bad at all, um, that return. Now, The Guardian, were the, you know, they were really jumping up and down because it did really well in the United Kingdom. Right? So in the opening uh, three days in the United Kingdom, it made 633,000, um, that's Australian dollars, and it made an overall box office of 2.9 million just in the, in, in the United Kingdom. As opposed to two hundred fifty-six thousand Australian. Now the film also performed well in other countries. So France made one point five million, Germany one point seven million, Italy two point five million, and America one point three million. Right? So globally, the film grossed uh, nine point five Australian dollars and had a budget of two point five million. So it did really well. You know, it was a a success, and that's um that's just theatrical box office. You know, that's before DVD sales. And I'm assuming DVD sales and uh, video on demand uh, did very well. Right. Now, um, Dev Verhoeven, Alwyn Davidson, and Bronwyn Cote, um, they, they wrote a very interesting piece in the journal Studies in Australasian Cinema in 2015. And they were talking about how do we how do we measure success, and what they were actually the way they came up with is you've got to look at many many different factors in how you measure a film success. Like you've got to look at reviews, you've got to look at venue circulation, like where did it play, how did it play, how much did it play, and you've also got to look at our international distribution and exhibition in addition to the global box office, which I'm going to do in just a sec. So when considering such elements, what could be understood for why the Babadook um, Australian release struggled to find a, a box office, um, sort of struggled to find the same box office of other countries, I think is um, a better way of putting it. All right, so most importantly, right, the Babadook only played on 13 screens, right? So it only opened on 13 screens. Now that's opposed to 147 screens in the United Kingdom. So there was just more availability for the film in the United Kingdom, right? Now, Richard Moore... And so he's the theatrical manager of Umbrella Entertainment in Australia, right? So he's he's got his finger on the pulse of um, you know the 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 marketing of the film in Australia, and uh, he says that the film was perceived as too art house for a, a mainstream audience. And what he said is, I quote: "We would have loved to go out on thirty screens if the multiplexes had decided to book it, but there was a discussion about whether the film is art house, and the multiplexes decided it was. So he's blaming the the multiplexes. Um, even though I, the question I put to you is, if if a multiplex audience went to this film, would they have actually enjoyed the film? Would they have embraced the film? You know, I, I would argue that it's an independent film and it needs to be understood in an independent context. Especially, it playing in independent cinemas actually benefits the film if you actually think about pleasing the audience and actually setting up a particular kind of film. Now, um, okay, so the United Kingdom aside, the film did not open well anywhere else. But in America, it only made 42,000 um, in the first opening weekend, but that was just on three screens. <laughs> it only opened on three screens in America. Right, so um, I don't know where those screens were, you know, if they were in kind of rural, hard to find areas, um, but it only made 42,000. So in comparison, did very well, did much better in Australia. Now, um, as the American success really su suggests, the Babadook success comes from what we, we term as the grey dollar movies. And the grey dollar movie 
are the films that generate revenue from critical reception and fan promotion over a long period. It's you know it's the when when the fans really get behind a film and really start pushing a film forward, so, which is why Kickstarter promotions are really important because if you put money into a film, like even if it's just fifty bucks or twenty bucks or whatever it is, you kind of feel like you have some stake in that in in, in that product. And you, you, you want to sort of champion that film and you want to see the end product. So you want to go out and you want to talk positively about it. I mean, if you put money into the Babadook, well, I think you're walking a bit higher, aren't you? You know, feeling like I put money into that film and that film was made because of me and I, you know, fantastic, um, I think. Anyway, more as in Richard Moore puts the film's international box office success down to expensive marketing campaigns. So he's a bit pissed, Richard Moore. He's a bit pissed about everything. And he says the UK... Okay, this is what he said, I quote. The UK figures are good, certainly, but if you spend a million pounds, you're going to have to make four million to profit. Well, I mean, the film the film actually um, you know, did pretty well, Richard Moore. I mean, I think that's a bit, it's a bit unfair. I mean, if your campaign didn't work, if your campaign didn't work, I mean, don't blame other campaigns that did work. You know, don't get snooty. Uh, now, different marketing strategies for its international distribution. So in Australia, Umbrella marketed the film as psychological thriller. Now, um, Bryony Kidd, she said, well, this is a bit odd. It's a bit odd, she thought, calling it a psychological thriller, when the film's um, explicit references to the touchstones of the genre, you know, the Polanski films and things like that. And if it's not a horror, then what exactly is the Babadook? And it comes down to a number of these Australian films, which are like, they're part of genres, but they're not part of any genre. And it, they're actually really hard to market because of that. So when you think of psychological thrillers, social, psychological thrillers often do really well in Australia, like um, What Not Lies Beneath and uh, Shutter Island with uh, Scorsese. And um, more appropriate... I, I would say is, um, you know, not that I'm, I'm telling Umbrella or uh, Richard Moore how to do their job because, you know, who am I? Some lowly academic, you know, just, just with, uh, you know, I'm not part of the marketing world. But if you actually go to the Kickstarter campaign, right, where the filmmakers were actually telling us how to think about the film, they refer to it as a psychological horror. So I'm just saying. At Umbrella, you may um, you may you may made a, you know may, you may want to go back to um, what they were saying Kickstarter because psychological horror I think is a good way of thinking about this film. Okay, so this this is the Australian poster. Uh, what do you think of this poster? Um, so it takes a line from the film, which um, if it's in a word or it's in a look, you can't get rid of the Babadook. And uh, this is from director Jennifer Kent, which it didn't really mean much because it was her debut film because, you know, she's not like a selling point. Anyway, a couple of quotes. Uh, it played at da Sundance, which it did well. Um, and Essie Davis um, gets a quote. Driven by a ripper of a performance by Essie Davis. Well done, Essie. All right, now this is a UK poster. It did well. Again, you can't get rid of the Babadook. And there's an image of the Babadook. And there's Samuel, the son, who's looking up. He's looking up past all of the the uh, the great reviews, the five-star reviews. He's looking past all the reviews to look at Mr. Babadook. And this is the American poster um, where there's... Um, yeah, they're very much a horror, isn't it? Like you've got uh, Amelia, Amelia's hand kind of screaming and Samuel in the middle. And he's sort of opening the door. And will haunt anyone who's ever heard a cry in the night or wondered what was under the bed in the dark. And uh, another one. You will be scared and also perhaps even more scarily moved. Which I, I think is a, a good way of also saying that. And, um, and it's got the certified fresh Rotten Tomatoes rating. Now, uh, okay, just a qu couple of quick things. Understandable that Umbrella was hesitant to put such horror labels on the film because in Mark Ryan's survey, which uh, I've got the link uh, for one of the readings for this week, 
right, where he investigated the top 50 films each year at the Australian box office from 1992 to 2012. And what he found was that horrors, horror films generally underperform in Australia. So all of this government funding are going into horror films. Well, we seem to be funding a lot of horror films, right? None of them are doing that well at the box office. So should we be funding the genres that uh, do better than other genres? Think about that. So, okay, think about this. Hugely successful horror films such as Paranormal Activity 4, the only thing better um, than Paranormal Activity 2 was that Paranormal Activity 4, right? So that was uh, that worldwide box office, 202 million. Jesus, big numbers. It made only 5.5% of that in Australia. That's 11 million, right? So still kills it in Australia, 11 million, but it's only making 5.5 of its overall, right? So 2%, um, that's 3 million Australian, was made in Australia for Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. Anyone see that? Worldwide box office. 165 million. Yeah, don't don't turn your nose up at that film. That killed it. Box office. Outside of Australia, European countries, Italy and France, and the United Kingdom are much stronger markets for horror. So if you're going to make a horror, do what Jennifer Kent did and just say, I'm just going to make an Australian horror for that market. Right? Because these countries love the Babadook. Absolutely loved it. Now, um, worth noting... Its Australian box office percentage of its worldwide gross was 2.7%. Right? And that is consistent with the general worldwide box office percentage of horrors in Australia. So the film actually didn't do that badly in Australia. Considering its limited 13 screens from three weeks of Australian distribution, theatrical distribution that is, the figure is actually quite steady. I'm just saying that. And um Contemporary horrors that Kent referenced in the Kickstarter campaign, let the right one in, Australia, right, it made $80,000 and globally it made $15 million. And the orphanage in Australia it made $633,000 um, and globally it made $108 million, right? So in Australia, um, these films are, you know, they're not killing it and the Babadook didn't kill it. So when you look at an Australian film... Don't just look at its national box office. You've got to look at its international box office. And I think that's the problem that um, a lot of people have with the Babadook. They say it wasn't actually a successful film. And it actually is a successful film. It just wasn't that successful in Australia, which is only one market. And when you're thinking about international Australian films, you know you should be thinking about its overall um, box office as well. Okay, final thought. Well, I leave you. Uh, how is the Babadook based on a performance? And Essie Davis, again, um, is just really killing this one. And the whole film is actually about her and her, her inner demons and her sort of coming to understand particular things about herself and her son and um, you know what's actually going on there. Uh, how does the feel, this film compare to other performance films from the course? So, you know, of course, it's actually looking at a lot of um, performances and films based around performances. And although it, it sort of it plays it within the, the sort of horror tropes, it is still very much a performance. And she, I mean, she looks the part so, so well, you know, this kind of um, sleep deprived, um, pale, you know, someone who doesn't really leave her house much. Uh, what similarities does this have to the child lost myth? And if you actually think of the child lost myth, you know, like, you know, Pinkney Hanger Rock would be an example of child lost myth, you know, where you've got, um, um, you, you know, blonde haired, um, dressed in white, wandering, getting lost. And Amelia very much plays with that, with that whole idea, you know, blonde hair, um, you know, she, she's actually dressed in white um, for a lot of the film. So it, it, it's certainly making explicit references to that whole idea. How the locations used. This is not a location film like we see in other location films. The film is set in Adelaide. It was shot um, on a soundstage for most of the part, all the interiors of the house, in Adelaide. But how the locations used. Because there is something of landscape here. It's just often the landscape is an interior landscape. And how is an idea of Australia represented there and is an idea of Australia represented there okay and just think of the way that you know the exteriors of the house um, are used and things like that um, also you know the fact is like they are houses they're not apartments 
you know, like in America and things like that. So you, you are very much in a suburb, but at the same time, it's trying to give you this nothing everywhere suburb. And what sort of Australia is being represented here? What resonance does the film have as an Australian film? How does this film resonate with you as an Australian film? Think accents, also think noises of that, that you being heard. Um, how's this film about outsiders? And like all the films we've been watching, it is a film about an outsider. It's about Amelia not being able to come to terms with, with anything, not being accepted into any community. And in the end, um, you know, what she realises is the community is her family, is her son, which is you know, really interesting um, about that. And the way that the Babadook actually becomes part of that community, which um, I'm not going to say any more than that. Um, and also, how is child abuse and mental health depicted? Obviously, I mean, the film, it's not a film that sort of says this is a film about mental health, and that would be a reading of the film. It's a reading, I would say, is quite prominent. I mean, I don't think I'm sort of coming up with a theory there. Um, I think the film is about mental health. It's just not like the, the mental health is being diagnosed or discussed as mental health. And also child abuse. Is this child abuse the way um, her relationship with her son, uh, the way she talks to her son at times, um, which is just out of frustration for so many things. All right, um, I'll leave it there. So that is The Babadook. Uh, look forward to seeing you all watch The Babadook. It's a beautifully cinematic movie. Jennifer Kent is a great visual, um, great visual eye. And the film looks absolutely terrific. And it looks absolutely really, really, really terrific on the big screen. So it needs to be seen on the big screen, ladies and gentlemen. So I look forward to, um, to seeing you all at the big screen to watch Babadook. All right. Um, see you there. And um, bye for now.